Margaret Marshall, the former Chief Justice of the Massachusetts Supreme Court, is our guest this morning. Let's go on the record. She wrote the 4-3 majority opinion that made gay marriage legal here in Massachusetts. Now this trailblazing jurist is watching the nation's Supreme Court. Her verdict on the nominee who could change the direction of the court for generations. Let's go on the record. From WCVB Channel 5, the inside word from Washington to Beacon Hill. Today's newsmakers are going on the record. Welcome to OTR. I'm Ed Harding along with News Center 5's political reporter Janet Wu. And as we have done through this entire pandemic, all social distancing protocols are being followed here in Studio C as we come to you this morning. But our guest this morning joins us via Zoom. She is Margaret Marshall, the former Chief Justice of the State Supreme Court. She retired back in 2010, but she remains an international icon in the gay rights movement. She joins us this morning from Cambridge. Madam Justice, great to have you with us. Great to see you. You look wonderful. Thanks for your time. Thank you for having me on the show. Thank you, both of you. It is great to have you join us this morning. Um, after your court's decision to legalize same-sex marriage here in Massachusetts, many other states followed suit, including the U.S. Supreme Court. But now two justices say they want to revisit that 2015 decision. With two justices supporting the law now gone, what do you think is going to happen in Washington? Well, I have to say, Janet, I, much has shocked me recently, but nothing shocked me as much as this concurrence. So let me explain to your readers. There was a request that the United States Supreme Court hear a case. I won't go into the specifics of the case, but it did involve same-sex marriage. And the justices turned down that request. What sometimes happens is that a justice will write a dissent about the decision uh, turning down the request. <clears throat> Justice Thomas didn't do that. What he did was light a concurrence. He agreed th with the fact that the, the Supreme Court had turned down the request to hear this particular case. And then he did something quite extraordinary. One, he wrote a blistering attack on the court's ruling in the gay marriage case, which is called Obergefell in the United States Supreme Court, <clears throat> which is very unusual because the question wasn't even in front of him. <clears throat> Excuse me, but worse than that, he then, if you read through, it's a four page diet slide in my view, then at the end of it, he said, and I'm reading, the court has created a problem that only it can fix. And to my mind, that was an invitation for the court to set aside a decision which was only a few years old in which the United States Supreme Court recognized that marriage is a fundamental right in our society. I found the writing of Justice Thomas, how he said it and what he was inviting the court to do was quite out of line and quite surprising. I was very concerned by this. So you people have Go ahead. I, I'm sorry. I just wanted to say, so you would consider this to be a serious threat. How soon could something happen, do you think, to change the law, the national, what is now a, a federal well, law? <clears throat> this was not in a case. This, as I say, this was in a, in a situation where the United States, <clears throat> I'm so sorry about this, the uh, United States Supreme Court had turned down a request to hear the case. But we do know that there have been many attempts to cut back on the breadth of Obergefell, you know, so that, for example, people don't have to supply wedding cakes or flowers mm -hmm. or, or mm -hmm. and this was the case that I'm mentioning was one where a, somebody who was authorized to give out uh, marriage licenses refused to do so because the couple um, was a same sex couple and that person um, actually went to prison and that was the issue in the case that they turned down. How soon could it happen? I hope that it won't happen. I mean, it would be quite extraordinary for the United States Supreme Court to, to roll back something that it has recognized as a fundamental right. I was trying to think of other occasions where this has happened. And the only one I could think of was <clears throat> after the Civil War and after the enactment of the 13th, 14th um, Amendments, the sort of legislative attempts uh, throughout the Southern states, the former con Confederacy states, to roll back uh, the recognition of racial, um, racial justice. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This is, um, uh, you know, Chief Justice Roberts is an extraordinary man. I mean, he cares deeply about the court. He cares deeply about precedent. 
as he has shown. Uh, there are occasions when there have been rulings on the United States Supreme Court where the court has, as it were, backtracked a little. Um, one could say, for example, that voting is a fundamental right. It is. Uh, and the court's decision in the Voting Rights Act, which essentially turned back a lot of the progress that we had made. But this is an all-out attack so soon after the court. I mean, the justice who wrote uh, the Obergefell decision, uh, Justice Anthony Kennedy, um, I think was very careful uh, in his language. He was very clear about what was at issue. Um, so, you know, I don't think the sky is falling, but it just reminds me of how fragile, even in our wonderful constitutional democracy, so, so with, rights can be. With that in mind, let's talk about the current court. Should a Supreme Court, as you know, there are eight justices on the court now, should a Supreme Court justice be nominated and approved in the final year of a presidential term, which is where we're sitting right now? We're actually in the final month of, of the, before the election, not of the term. There's nothing in the Constitution that prohibits that. I mean, everybody can do that. But as we saw, um, one of the tragedies that is happening here, and I think Chief Justice Roberts is trying very hard to undo the perception that has sort of hung over the court since Bush against Gore, he's trying to undo the perception that um, <clears throat> it's, it's purely politics. It's Republican and you go one way and Democrat, you go the other way. Take for example, there have been very few occasions when an opening has occurred um, in, in, the, um, in, the, in the final year um, of a president's term. The most recent, of course, was um, President um, Obama. So let's assume that the Senate uh, Majority Leader Mitch McConnell had not held up President Obama's nominee, Merrick Garland, uh, would have, I assume, been confirmed, very likely confirmed, if he'd been given an opportunity. And he's a wonderful, wonderful judge. Uh, he would have been confirmed, and then for a short time, the court would have gone back to having a slight, slight liberal 5-4 vote. And then uh, Justice Ginsburg, sadly, would have uh, passed on. and. President Trump could nominate who he wanted to nominate, and the court might have gone back the other way. The whole point about our Constitution is it is written in grand terms, and then there's a way that one looks to see what is helpful, what is helpful to implement this great document. I think what is so um, unnerving to the American people is that somebody like the Senate president, somebody like the president, can turn on a dime as soon as it suits them. So much, I mean, you must have seen the many times that we focused on a Lindsey Graham, a Mitch McConnell, a Senator Graham, Senator McConnell, you know, saying one thing when it was President Obama nominating Merrick mm -hmm. Garland, mm -hmm. another thing now. I mean, I think the American people are losing confidence in you know this great court um and i think that that's a tragedy for the united states well let's drill down a little bit on this um amy coney barrett uh, no, uh, expected uh, vote um some democratic senators including both of our senators from massachusetts have been refusing to meet with her is this appropriate or best practice when you think about the larger issues here you know, Janet, I'm I'm not a senator, and I don't make you know decisions. Um, I, I think there's such outrage of the double standard that was applied to President Obama, and now to President Trump's nominee. Um, and I don't accept any of the explanations for the you know the flip flop that's been going on. And I can understand why somebody might feel outraged. Um, again, what I what I see in each of this, we have three co-equal branches of government. I mean, you know, I headed one branch of government. I always treated the heads of the other two branches with the greatest respect. I never um, demeaned them in any kind of way. If they wanted to meet with me, if I wanted to meet with them, I met with them. But I can understand the outrage. So I'm not going to attack my two senators, um, you know, for declining to meet with her. I think they feel that it doesn't make any difference if they meet with her. 
um, and that's a terrible feeling because you always want to have a sense. I mean, they may have, they may think that she should not be confirmed, and then they meet with her. And actually, believe it or not, in our history, people have changed their minds mm -hmm. when they meet somebody. Um, but when you feel that it doesn't make any difference, what you do, it doesn't make any difference. You're just going to be, you know, it's just going to be railroaded through. I, by the way, think this is not good for Judge Bell if she is confirmed. I think it is not good for her. Um, I, you know, it, were I in her shoes, and I am not, I'm just assuredly not in her shoes, I would say if I am confirmed, I will not, I will not participate in any deliberations if it involves uh, the current election which is ongoing. Margaret. I will look at myself. Mm -hmm.